Hi, welcome back to video four in our series. We're going to talk about uh, risk number five, mitigating taxes, and I refer to it as the lurking slaughter. What happens, or, or pretty much is, you know, one of my favorite topics, uh, and I can draw upon my, my accounting degree and my certification by the IR, you know, the IRS and ARP as a tax preparer, I can really help folks make a difference. What you have to understand, it's very important uh, to develop a tax strategy. It's critical for anything in retirement income planning. And, and I do stress this a lot in most of the, um, the programs. You really need to do a pro forma analysis all the time. A pro forma, a pro forma is simply a, a, a what if a 1040 tax return to see how that strategy would really work under um, real life scenario. Um, some of the tax information that we're going to review in this program is also has been reviewed under the Social Security video series, as well as the more, uh, you know, be a fuller discussion in the tax reduction strategy video series as well. So as we go through those different things, you'll, you may catch a few topics uh, that are maybe not as explained as deeply, but they'll go into the other videos or go into a little bit more deeper explanation. Since 2013, uh, investors have really gotten four different capital gain uh, tax brackets, and this includes the Medicare, the 3.8 Medicare surcharge uh, tax on net investment income. Here's what happens. Many times this sheer size of a gain will propel an investor into higher tax brackets, and the ultimate thing that's interesting is they may wind up finishing with less wealth. Let's take a look at, as a um, hypothetical scenario. We have Joe and Kathy. Uh, together they have about $90,000 worth of income from pension, Social Security, and uh, interest after deductions. Their investments, their investment portfolio is generating about $50,000 a year in long-term capital gains. Here's what happens. If the couple, you know, if they recognize the gain each year, and they pay tax on it, their long-term capital gain rate will be at 15%. Now, what that equates to, it's about $7,500. And over that 10-year period, on the $500,000 in gains, they would have paid a cumulative tax of about $75,000. Let's look and see if we apply a tax managed strategy, uh, you know, some broker, your advisor said, let's do a tax managed strategy, and you don't do it with the tax, a pro forma tax return. You just say, oh, that sounds good. Let's save taxes. So let's take a look. You're looking at a strategy where um, they implement, but at the end of the decade, they now have a $500,000 unrealized gain. Remember, they, they deferred the taxes for those uh, 10 years and they didn't pay them each year as they went on. Now, at the end of the 10 year period, for whatever reason, they, they need to make an investment change. Uh, they're gonna be taxed at these levels as a blend of 15%, 18.8, and 23.8% brackets. Now, what happens, the end result that they wind up paying, it's significantly more in taxes than being tax efficient for that decade. Now, that's an oxymoron or it's counterintuitive because how could being tax efficient cause you to pay more taxes? What I try to explain again is anytime you do any thought process, if you're going to think, I want to try this strategy, you have to do a pro forma tax return to see what would have been the difference? Would it make sense to pay the tax each year or wait to the end? If you looked at it in the beginning and say, wow, I'm going to pay a lot more at the end, maybe it would make sense for me to pay the taxes or you know, pay the taxes earlier, or maybe a different strategy would work. Now, you got to realize there's a, a many, many different levels of taxes. You have your capital gains, you have your ordinary income taxes, but what I want to stress is what the IRS misses while you're alive. They'll quickly find and cannibalize after you're gone. Now, you want to be careful that the legacy you're leaving to family 
does not become a tax legacy because certain assets when passed to family. Now, I refer to family as non-spousal beneficiaries. Now, it's important. I do use the term interchange. I say family. Obviously, a spouse is family. But when I refer to um, family, in this case, or, or these cases, it's non-spousal beneficiary. So these would be your children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, brothers, sisters, whoever it may be, um, is a very, big, very, very big difference. Now, certain assets are treated very well. Uh, IRS rules with um, IRAs, they're treated terribly. I refer to the individual retirement account. You know, people say, oh, IRA, I have an ind individual retirement account. I kind of joke and I say that it's actually an internal revenue account because assets that are in an IRA, 401k, uh, SEPs, those type of plans, 403bs, are very, are clobbered big time with taxes and the taxes could amount to 50 to 70 percent of the value of that account. That's a great money maker for the IRS, uh, but I, I just want to explain that's a massively huge number. So retirement accounts were never designed to be estate planning vehicles for non-spouses. What's important if you if you don't want I or, uh, Uncle Sam to be your biggest beneficiary, then don't die with money in these IRA 401 type accounts without knowing the rules that they put on top of those accounts. Now, um, what else is different about IRAs? Well, IRAs are unlike other assets and they do not pass through your will or your trust. Most of your assets will pass through your will or trust, but IRAs are a separate beast. They do not pass through your will. So in, in essence, your will has no control over these type of accounts. The real problem happens when people think, oh, I have X dollars and they treat their retirement accounts as uh, other assets like their home or stocks or, 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 or savings. You have to understand uh, because they're treated differently, IRA accounts have a different and an additional set of rules that our other investments don't have. The problem is no one tells you what these rules are. You have to ask. And the problem is this. If you don't know, how do you know to ask? Or you don't know what to ask. So one of the big problems that, that, that happens here is most of these accounts wind up not being structured properly and the government comes in and takes a huge hit. Now, regardless, and a lot of people tell me, well, Joe, I don't, I'm not concerned because, you know, the federal estate tax uh, exemption, I can pass, you know, over five, five and a half million dollars, and, and there's no problem with that, you know, with no estate taxes. And I explained to them, I said, you're correct, but IRAs are subject to a different level of tax. They're subject to income taxes which is very different than a state tax. So they're technically, if you're under that limit of 5.5 .5 million or whatever it is, uh, you can pass an IRA estate tax free, but not income tax free. Uh, once the Fed gets their part of it, and then you got to realize there's also, you know, state income taxes that may be due. Now, I, I kind of joke with folks and, and I, I ask some simple questions and, and I normally get a you know, wide range of answers. So if your beneficiaries inherit an IRA, um, do they have to take all the money out? And people, I get blank stares sometimes and, and they'll give me an answer. Uh, can they roll it over to their own IRA if they're under 59 and a half? You know, I, I, you know my children are younger than that age and... Uh, can they take mom or dad's IRA? They've inherited it. Could they roll it into their own? Um, can they postpone taking money out until they're seven and a half? Now, uh, if my children are in their 40s or 50, um, can they wait until 70 and a half to take the money out of an inherited IRA? Um, do, they, do they use the same withdrawal, withdrawal chart uh, that I use uh, for my IRA? And um, is the IRA protected from creditors or ex-spouses? 
Uh, a lot of these things, people you know, get all different kind of answers, but the answer to all of the questions is simply no, they can't. So what I'm trying to stress here is that IRAs are a very separate animal and they need to be treated very differently. The problem is 98% of all IRAs are not set up properly. Um, we, like I said, we review this a lot more extensively in the uh, you know, tax reduction series, uh, but besides the big tax loss, what happens to these IRAs is you lose or your family loses years of tax-free or tax-deferred growth, and that's gone forever, and that's going to be a huge number. Now, a lot of folks will ask, you know, what about Social Security or how is my Social Security tax? Well, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, you know, back in 1984, they decided to tax uh, wealthy Americans uh, and they applied these numbers um, to the tax situation. And if you're looking at an individual, if they're earning uh, not a lot of money, uh, including their Social Security, they're not going to pay any tax on Social Security. So in this case, if their total combined income of whatever they're getting outside and half of Social Security is less than $25,000, then the Social Security is income tax free. The design there makes a lot of sense. The concept was you really can't tax these folks. They're you know, fairly uh, not well off uh, and they don't obviously have any money to pay the tax. Now, as you go a little higher and you look, you'll see that at 50% uh, of benefits become taxable if your income is between $25,000 and $34,000. Now, this is a single individual, and, and very simply what this means, you take all your assets, your interest, and your, and your pension, or whatever you have, um, savings, and you add half of Social Security, whatever you've got in Social Security, add half of that. If it equals $25,000, but less than $34,000, then half of that Social Security income becomes taxable. As you look up a little further, you'll see that the um, number goes to 85% if your income is greater than $34,000. So if you're a single individual and you're making uh, between half of your Social Security and um, other assets, uh, income, pensions, whatever, uh, then 85% of your Social Security becomes taxable. Now, if you look at the tax return that we just went over, uh, or we're just going to go over, you'll see if you look at the um, line 14A and 14B, you'll see the numbers for Social Security, how much more is put into the taxable event when we add additional RMDs or required distributions in there. If you look, as you look at this next slide, it's essentially similar to the first section. Uh, this is a married uh, filing a joint return. Uh, if the total income including half the Social Security is less than 32000 then the 32000 or the Social Security income is completely income tax free. Um, if they're between 32000 and 44000 remember we have to add in half of their Social Security to their other income. If it equals thirty two or 44000 then the 50% of their Social Security becomes taxable. Uh, the same scenario, they take half the Social Security, add it to other income, uh, and if it's greater than $44,000, then you'll see a full 85% of uh, tax due on that Social Security. If you turn to Tax Return A, you'll see there's Tax Return A and Tax Return B. There's actually that section uh, has five pieces in it. So what I want you to do is look at Tax Return A, and Tax Return A is going to have, uh, get, go to the first page. It'll have my name on it, uh, my spouse's name on it. And I want you to take a look and start to go down at, at these things. Number one, let's look at line 8A. Line 8A shows interest of, uh, they may have had a CD and they got about $121 worth of interest. So, and I ask the question sometimes, you know, folks, you know, what does CD stand for? And everyone uh, in the group will raise their hand or their shout out, it's a certificate of deposit. And I go, no, everybody's wrong. I said, what CD stands for is a Certificate of Disappointment. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when Carter was president uh, and the CD rates were <laughs> obviously way higher than they are now. So let's look at that $121 worth of interest. Uh, we're going to go into line 12 
it's going to show they have a pension of about $45,000 in income. And if you go to line 14A, it's going to show their Social Security, uh, which is about $50,000. Now, what I want you to do is either turn the page or go to the next page, which is actually A1. And you're going to see line 39. And it's going to tell you, based on, excuse me, based on those numbers, uh, this couple has taxable income of about 30, uh, or line 39, of taxable income, or the taxes due about $6,611. Now, let's do tax return B. We're going to show it's virtually identical. So to do a test, uh, we're going to keep all the numbers the same except one thing. We're going to show the same $45,000 in pension, the same $50,000 in Social Security income, and the small amount of interest in the Certificate of Disappointment. Now, let's take a look and show what one withdrawal of $20,000 would do to that tax return. Now, it could be your required distribution. It could be you just wanted or needed some money. You wanted to go on a vacation. Uh, you wanted to take more than your required distribution. Uh, who knows? Who cares? Uh, you know, my wife and I were fortunate last year. We took uh, two of our oldest grandchildren to, to Disney in Florida. You may want to do that. Uh, you know, whatever. It's, it's the object. It's your money. You, you want to use some of it. You have that right. And let's just take a look at how the tax changes. Now, if you're looking at tax return B, you're going to see line 8A. Uh, it's going to show the same interest of $121. The difference here is we have line 11A. 11A shows the IRA distribution of $20,000. Going to line 12, it's the same as it was before of $45,000. Go to line 14A, shows the Social Security of $50,000. But now what I want you to do is I want you to turn the page. And we're going to look at B1. And it's showing the difference now. If you look at line 39, and I want you to kind of see it with me, what's the taxes due on that $20,000 increase? Now, everything else stayed the same, but the benefit went up $20,000. The tax is now $12,719. That's a huge, huge difference. Okay, what I'd like you to do now is take your other part of the tax package. You have the two tax returns, A and B. There's another piece of paper in there. And what we're going to look at, it, I think, is something that's pretty interesting, a little synopsis of the whole uh, tax return. What I want you to look at is on the first tax return, we had a, a tax due, a return A, of about $6,611. After the $20,000 withdrawal on uh, tax return B, uh, we had a tax due of $12,719. So what I want to bring up here, it, it's pretty straightforward. We took $20,000 additional out, but the taxes went up another $6,108. Now, if you do some quick uh, division and you divide the 61 by the 20,000, you're going to find out that the tax rate, the tax bracket, uh, went up 32.7%. So we're paying 32.7% more taxes. Uh, if you want to round it off, it's basically a 33% tax rate. So if you look at the chart down below, I highlighted it in red, and you'll look down for a 33% uh, you know, bracket. Uh, a married filing a joint return, that's an income between $231,000 and $413,000. What I'm trying to explain here is this small withdrawal really push these folks up into a tax bracket that would be considered ultra wealthy of uh, people making uh, almost a little over $400,000 a year. So when we look at the numbers on a tax return, it's very important. And I know I do stress that a few times uh, that any strategies have to be looked at by doing a pro forma tax return or a pro forma 1040 just to see how these numbers actually look in the end. 
As we move on to the next risk, we're going to find uh, risk number six is phantom wealth, and I call it the optical delusion. When we look at phantom wealth, I, I try to explain it. it. It appears to be real or has a physical existence, uh, but can vanish quickly. It's like believing what your home or business will be worth or looking at retirement plan, uh, plan balances and forgetting what percentage has to be taken off the top for taxes or how um, significant systematic risk is or sequence of returns that can devour a balance. Uh, what we have and what we believe we have is much more frail than we think. Uh, it, you know, I use this scenario sometimes. If there are five houses on your block for sale and there are only three buyers, you know, looking for homes, um, then you get what they call it's a buyer's market. A buyer's market will ensue. This will cause prices to fall. And what we'll do is we'll create worry among retirees or the people that are trying to sell their house who, who really want to kind of protect their nest egg. And they're basically hoping, that, I don't want to be the last one out the door, so I got to make sure my house sells and I'll, I'll, I'll reduce the price enough to get it to sell. So I, I'm not going to get into too much of into an escalating or de-escalating home prices, but just to give you the uh, idea that phantom wealth is not um, tangible dollars. So it's very important to understand that. What um, is your investment worth? If I liquidate it today, uh, minus any fees or taxes or other costs. And let's go back to the home and let's say your home is valued at $500,000 after selling commissions, taxes, repairs, and whatever you do, you're going to net about $400,000. Um, now, you can't plan around a $400,000 number because it's still phantom wealth. But you said, Joe, you, you basically need to say, um, you know, I, I took out taxes and and um, commissions and all that stuff. So I'm netting the 400000 I can use that number to plan with. The answer is you cannot. And the reason you can't is the home may be worth less some years or even months down the road. So if you're going to plan on technically that $400,000 number, you have to liquidate the asset now. If you don't, it's still considered phantom well. I don't care how well you think you planned, you don't know the future, and you have no idea what this asset may be worth months or even a few years down the road. Now, um, retirement accounts ha have a, a great amount of phantom wealth uh, for a couple of reasons. One, they don't have a solid floor beneath them, and unfortunately most do not, so that the account, uh, and the floor is simple, that the account can't dip below a certain amount and has guaranteed values. So what happens most often, or what should happen, is if you had guaranteed growth uh, and also a floor underneath your retirement account, then you can be protected against phantom wealth. If not, if that account is subject to fluctuation, then again, most of that you see in, the, in your account statement is phantom wealth. Let's look at uh, risk seven, which is asset allocation, which a lot of folks, if you've done any investing, understand what that term is, versus product allocation. The difference is in the accumulation phase, in other words, we're building savings, uh, asset allocation is important. Um, you really kind of need to have a little bit here, a little bit there. If you put too much in any one asset class or sector or industry, you're setting yourself up for disappointment if something goes wrong. In the retirement income phase, product allocation becomes even more important or actually is the most important. This methodology helps individuals determine how to split or distribute retirement egg across a wide variety of choices. It should be an ad hoc uh, situation. You, you have to use sound judgment when you do your retirement product allocation because there's no single product that addresses all the risks to your financial capital. However, 
when you diversify across financial products, it, it help reduce the risk tremendously. And you'll be able to enhance your chance of having retirement, what they call retirement sustainability. So it's also important to diversify products over and across time horizons. Our last risk we're going to talk about is unknown unknowns. And that's, you know, pretty straightforward. And the world is changing rapidly. And I asked the question, are you prepared especially for unknowns and unknowns? You know, unknown unknowns. And people say, Joe, how could you prepare for an unknown unknown? Well, the thing is pretty straightforward. You know, some of us will be in for some big surprises. Uh, that will change your life for the worse. So when we look at these unknown unknowns or black swans or these different events, we have to plan for something that we don't know what it is. And, and that becomes very difficult. When we look at um, all these uh, possibilities, you know, nobody knows. It is, it, it, that's the whole reason that they're unknown unknowns. But when we rely on past performance, when we look at averages and we use that to predict how the market will or how our retirement will unfold, despite all the warnings that no one knows, we kind of walk in lockstep uh, to those old movies where the, you see the, the, the South chain gang. Uh, they have their hand on one guy's shoulder and they're all walking in what they call lockstep. We're going into retirement the same way with no guarantees. Because we don't know there are some or there will be unknown unknowns, it's we got to remember that risk is real. And if it weren't real, we wouldn't be rewarded for taking it. You know, the thing that's important is this. If you have accumulated some assets, you know, risk is for people trying to get where you are already. Because the future is uncertain and risks, you know, there are great risks, it's critical that we start to plan for uncertainties. It sounds like a Herculean task, uh, but the following, the guidance provided um, will allow you to really have a lifeboat that's more than a small dinghy. Uh, it'll become a really uh, comfortable houseboat. What you can do um, is to review a little bit more about unknown unknowns. You can go and there's a complete list in your book. Uh, it's on page 95. Again, I do apologize for the exact page numbers. Um, as the final book is played out, uh, it may be you know a little bit more, maybe page 97 or so, but it'll be in that general area and then you can find it at that location. This is the end of section four. Uh, let's do a quick review of some of the highlights. In this section, we talked about mitigating taxes, uh, a little bit about my accounting background. Uh, we did an extended discussion uh, with the tax return. Uh, that was also picked up in the Social Security as well as the tax reduction series. We talked about capital gains tax and using a tax managed strategy um, could be a problem. It actually called it an oxymoron. Uh, and again, always do a pro forma tax return uh, to evaluate strategy. I stress that all the time. You don't know what something's going to do tax wise until you do a tax return for it. Uh, we talked about lightly the IRA and the in, or the internal revenue account. Uh, you cannot treat IRAs like other assets. And remember, regardless of any estate taxes, the IRA is always, always subject to income taxes. We did a very quick test of the IRA knowledge, uh, Social Security, how it's taxed. Uh, we reviewed, again, that 1040 very lightly. Um, phantom wealth appears to be real, but it's not. And then, ultimately, um, the unknown unroad, unknowns and risk is real. Hi, it's nice to have you back. Congratulations on finishing part four of your video series. I'm excited. I hope your learning experience is going uh, very quickly. Again, as always, take advantage of any of the Q&A, uh, any of the reports that were being offered. 
uh, as well as you can always go back and replace sections that weren't 100% clear. Uh, looking forward to catching at the end of Section 5. Thank you.